Ukraine is introducing an anti-air drone specifically meant to shoot down Russian drones, while the Ukrainian government has started building underground factories for its defense industry. In direct connection to this is an announcement by the Swedish government that they are going to invest into the Ukrainian defense industry, which will obviously help finance all of this. We'll talk about this as well as about the developments along the front line in this situation report about the war in Ukraine. Russian air attacks obviously continue and in the latest ones a Shahid drone, the fragments of one fell on the building of the Ukrainian Rada, the Ukrainian National Parliament. According to the reports there was no serious damage done with this. Uh, Zelensky, the Ukrainian president, said over 800 gliding bombs, almost 300 Shahid drones and over 60 missiles were used against Ukraine in the last week alone. A, Ukra a Russian drone also fell down down, crashed in Lithuania and by now it's clear that it was carrying explosives. The type I have not heard yet but it's likely that it was a Shahid drone that crashed in Lithuania so quite a while away. Um, uh, Lithuania is here actually. <laughs> That's um, Latvia. Um, but quite a while away from the from the battle zone. We'll switch over to the events along the front line. We go to Kursk and here we have the Russians reporting that uh, the attacks by the Ukrainians at Snagost continue. Now, according to the maps and according to what we've seen, Snagost is under Ukrainian in, uh, under Ukrainian control. So attacks there are unclear whether they are going towards the west or towards the north. I think it's more like, likely that they are aiming at Korenevo, as here they are in danger of being pushed back and lose this corridor here that cuts off the Glushkovo pocket. But that's my deduction from it. I cannot fully say what is is um, what actually happened there. Then we have uh, the geolocation of a Ukrainian presence by a Russian attack on the western part of this Krasno and then something I don't even try to pronounce this town, um, which is not a big change, but it shows that this area here is now under Ukrainian control as well. This is now being held by the Ukrainians as well. The Ukrainians also destroyed the rush the last bridge over the same here at Karis. I've shown you, I think it was the last situation report or maybe two ago where the over this piece here a Russian car was still driving and now we see what happened. Um, it got struck and the interesting part is the video initially shows something that to me almost looks like um, it might have been a path here, uh, an auxiliary bridge that was being constructed here. I'm not completely sure. It seems to be partially underground. And once the strike is over, it's definitely, uh, it seems to be destroyed as well. Um, I'm not completely sure whether this also destroyed the last piece here. This is unclear as of now, but the strike happened and I geolocated it was fairly easy because of the trees that it was the last bridge here at Karish. We switch over to the eastern part here. The Russians managed to enter the northern part of Cherkaskoe Perechnoe here. Um, this is a minor change, but we have the Russians moving into the northernmost houses. So roughly at, um, where, where is it? Roughly at this point here. Um, they gained some ground in this situation. Generally, the Russian mill bloggers are reporting several smaller Russian successes. They are talking about 100 to 400 meters most of the time, but none of this is geolocated and I do not have a Ukrainian admission of defeat that would correspond with this. So those successes might be possible. They might just be uh, fiction though, because a 400 meter advance obviously is hard to prove and thus still a allows for good news even if they hadn't happened. We, But that's it from the Kursk region. The fighting is continuing there, but it's um, no significant changes over the last week or so in this region here. And in Kharkiv, not much is different. No change in territory, but we have a claim that the Ukrainians did a counterattack with tanks. So a mechanized attack happening with the um, by the Ukrainians. A day later, Russian mill bloggers wrote that two Ukrainian 
um, armored fighting vehicles were attacking. I'm not sure that might be a second attack that has happened. That might be a report about the attack that the, the Russian mill blogger mentioned here. That I can't say for sure, but uh, I do not see any change in territory. Ukrainians were claiming that the factory here was being shelled by the Russians. That would be an indication that maybe they've lost it. But on the other hand, there were claims that the Russians did not fully control all of it. So the shelling might have been meant towards the parts that are not controlled by the Russians. As, of, as I said, for now, I can't really clarify it much, much more. Further to the east, on the eastern front, we have the Russians in southern Sinkivka. Um, this is significant because Sinkivka was the front line for quite a while and we now have them geolocated down here. Now lately they raised the flag up here and then they admitted that the southern road there are still houses in one line of uh, one one uh, one row of houses along one street is still under Ukrainian control. That's what we see here. Now we have the Russian presence roughly here. Whether that means that all of it is under Russian control is unclear. They might have just come over here, even though it's probably more likely that they came over this part. The Russian Ministry of Defense is claiming that they captured Sinkivka. It's definitely possible, but we do not have conclusive proof as of yet. We know that they are in the west, we know that they are in the north, and that in between there might still be some Ukrainian presence. But as I said, I think it's likely that the Russians have captured Sinkivka, um, according to what I see here. Other than that, no changes that I can confirm. Uh, Ukrainian counterattacks, for instance, happened here at, um, at Pishchane, but uh, those attacks were meant at uh, inhibiting the Russians. They were rather spoiling attacks than serious attempts to push the Russians back from the videos I've seen, so no change has happened here. We have nothing north of the Sivesky Donetsk. Now, fighting is reported in the Sivesk direction, but no change here. No change around Chasiv Yar either. I do not see any change. We have a fresh geolocation up here, but that's already under Russian control for at least a week. So we switch over to the southern area here. And um, in the area of Toretsk, we have a change, a smaller change, and that is the Russians roughly being at this point here now. Um, I have not seen them be there before. We have a geolocation. This is, these are the houses that are visible here. And as you can see, where was it? Was it? No. As you can see, it's fairly close to it. Um, I might have been too optimistic. Maybe the Russians are more here, but that's a little, a little south presence, a little south than where they have recently been. But we do not see them significantly advancing into Retsk for a couple of days now. But this is the region where the third, no, the twelfth assault brigade, I think, from the SOV regiment was recently deployed. They also managed to um, conduct successful counterattacks in New York. We see the effect here already on the ground. Then uh, further west in the direction of um, Avdivka, roughly in the or in the direction we would say we should rather say in Pokrovsk, um, we have quite a number of changes. Just to quickly mention New York, there are some claims of additional Ukrainian advances in the recent 24 to 48 hours. I do not, do not see any visual evidence, so as of now they are unproven. Um, we have the Russians in um, in Mykhailivka. There is a presence by them confirmed in the area here. No, this is here. Mykhailivka is next to Selidove, so we have no change up here. Rodivka, the maps changed, but it just shows us what we've already seen. I showed you in the last situation report, the Russians having presence in this house here. Um, further south at Mykhailivka, we have uh, fighting is continuing here. I do not see any change in the direction of Selidove. Uh, the, the, that was really bad. <laughs> the Russians are tri still trying to advance in this direction, but I do not see any change. What we do have, though, is a, a advance in the southern tree line here. Um, let me see if I can identify it properly. I think it should be this one here. Yeah, that's this. So we have them advancing to the to the south here, directly south of the town. But um, that's all we have from this point here. We have a um, the Ukrainians reporting that in Hrinik, 
I think, more or less. Here, fighting is continuing. They, the Russians have reached the outskirts of the town and uh, they seem to be fighting ab ar um, about the, the um, or fighting for the first houses in the north. I do not, I cannot confirm that they managed to enter it properly. There were already rumors that the town had fallen a couple of days ago. That seems to be definitely untrue according to the informations that I see from both sides as of now. Um, the Russians have recently advanced south of Ukraine but they don't did not seem to advance uh, much more in the last few two or three days but we have a claim here um, in the area between uh, Liskivka and Shelane Perche I think I have it here uh, the situation between Lisivka and Shelane Perche is extremely bad. Some of our boys were surrounded. I hope they will be pulled out somehow because there are 300 of them. 300 should not be, from my understanding, 300 does not mean it's 300 of them. This should mean, this is probably lost in translation, 300 should be the military code for wounded. Because the, the area where they could be cut off is, is likely the area west of the river here. That would make perfect sense and there is no way the Ukrainians have 300 men there. There should be significantly less and I would bet even the whole of Shelane Perche is defended by less than 300 men. So the likely interpretation is that the, according to this Ukrainian soldiers, the Russians surrounded a couple of them probably west of the river here and they have wounded there, but not, not that it's 300 men. This needs to be understood. 200 is the code used for um, deceased, 300 is the code for wounded and this has to be understood when 200 or 300 is mentioned. Then we have the Russians advancing in the area of Nevelske. Um, here they just gained a little ground in the area here. The Russians had already taken Nevelsky a couple of days ago. Now they are straightening out the front line, occupying tree lines, more or less in this area here. We see that the Ukrainians are likely pulling back. They should be in the process of withdrawing, at least from the easternmost positions here, to prevent them uh, uh, being encircled here, to, to prevent them being cut off, as the Russians recently advanced south here in the rough direction of uh, Kurachove, and they recently advanced towards the west from Krasnohorivka, and as you can see, the area in between is getting smaller where those so soldiers here can be supplied from and where they could potentially withdraw. So it again, it would make sense and it would be de, would be expected that the whole area here, at least east of this here, should fall to the Russians within the next week or two. This should not surprise us at this at this very moment. Then further south, we have the uh, Russians uh, also advancing, on, not really further south, we have the Russians advancing north of Krasnohorivka. This is already here on the map, but just for to... Um, mention everything completely. We have them advancing a little bit north here. We recently had them at these positions. We had them advancing west. We had them here. Now they are pushing somewhat to the north here again. Um, to which degree this is because the Ukrainians abandoned positions, to which degree the Russians are trying to force them out of this is unclear as of now, but the Russians gained additional positions. Further south, the situation at Vuledar is getting more critical. There's no sugarcoating this. The Russians have captured Vodiane. Now, there are some claims that this is not true. We have Noel reports here saying that two Ukrainian military sources uh, claim that contrary to deep state, this ha they have not fallen. Um, so there is still a possibility, but we also have not just deep state attributing Vodiane completely to the Russians. We have Petrenko as well, who says they have captured it. And as I mentioned in the past, Petrenko is a Ukrainian mill blogger, pro-government Ukrainian mill blogger, who has proven in the past to be really reliable. This is not a full proof it might be possible that Vodiane has not fallen but to the to what I see from the past the the attributing um, the the maps and the sources that admit Ukrainian defeat I think it's very likely over 80 percent that Vodiane is now under Russian control this will obviously worsen the situation at Vuleda the Russians ha are pushing towards Solota Niva so the road of Vuleda to the west here is unusable for quite a while actually already and um, from what I've checked it does not seem to be that in the area up here there are many paved roads. Uh, on Google Maps, even this road that we see here, even this road 
does not seem to be it's obviously straight um the the road here does not seem to be paved i'm not 100 percent sure though if we check it here we can quickly zoom in um this does not look paved to me so i'm not sure how how much trouble the ukrainians will get in case that um do we have anything else no those all seem to be dirt roads um whether they have a paved road or not left i i unfortunately am not able to confirm fully this is not the biggest issue we've seen the ukrainians using dirt roads in the past even during the rasputitsa for instance for the supply of bakhmut but it's obviously still uh, worsening the situation no longer being able to use paved roads limits the equipment that can be used to supply Vulida and it limits the speed which, with which Vulida can be supplied and thus increases the danger for any resupply vehicle going towards the town here itself. So the situation of Vulida is getting worse by the day and um, it has not yet fallen and we'll have to see how long the Ukrainians will be able to hold out but with the loss of Vodiane they're losing their northeastern flank. The Russians are here in the mine so that will threaten the northeastern flank even more. We'll have to see when the Ukrainians will be forced to pull out. Then um, the Russians try to attack from the south as well. They enter the, I think it's an industrial area north of Pavlivka. We have a geolocation here where they mentioned where they charged over this. But from the video I've seen, they were defeated. Those were infantry troops on motorcycles and they suffered severe losses there. And in the end, you see the burning motorcycles. I don't think they managed to gain a foothold here. And some of the um, the uh, losses were seem to have been caused by by rifle fire which would indicate that the Ukrainians are still operating themselves in the area here so the southern flank at least for now seems to be secure for Vuleda. And that's it with territorial changes. I have nothing else, so we simply skip it. Um, we go to an overall assessment, and there we have um, an overall not much changed position. The Ukrainians have mostly stopped the Russians in the direction of Pokrovsk. They are gaining ground in New York, and they are seem to have mostly stopped the Russians in Turetsk. So the situation here is still dangerous and that doesn't mean Pokrovsk will not fall. Most analysts still think it's quite possible that the Russians will reach Pokrovsk and take it in the end but it's no longer um, the 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 risk seems to be significant lower than significantly lower that the Russians will reach it within days and um, cut it off in a very short time frame the ukrainians definitely seem to have bought significant time now the russians seem to focus on securing their flank by pushing here towards the south reaching Korahove. they want to take out vuledar and probably push the front at least to this here thus widening their supply base and they're securing their flank towards pokrovsk and at the same time obviously allowing themselves to use the railroad line here in the south the ukrainians on the other hand um, are facing uh, steady bombardment and attacks with glide bombs, drones and the cruise missiles and they are working here on improving their own their own defense against that and here the army inform claims that a significant number of them is now being jammed with electronic warfare so they don't even find their target there must be a, a translation error I think because they say they primarily has radar guidance that would be completely new to me I think they are GPS guided or GLONASS guided so a satellite navigation should be the guidance here not radar and I wouldn't understand how unless it has a radar seeker in the head and it has a a software that has mapping of the ground if that was the case then maybe but that I haven't heard of this but maybe we, I learned something new here but regardless I think this is a translation error and they claim that a lot of the Shahid are now being um, jammed and thus don't find their target in troop generation and force generation we have news from Iran here a member of the National Security Council uh, Security Commission of the Iranian Parliament says, yeah, of course we give mis missiles to Russia. We give them to Hamas, we give them to Hezbollah, we give them to um, to the Houthis. So why wouldn't we give it to Russia? And he basically says, so what's supposed to happen? Uh, we already sanctioned, so nothing much can happen anymore. Um, this seems to be more or less uh, a confirmation now that the Iranians have delivered indeed ballistic short-range short missiles to the Russian government. 
Then we have reports that Russian uh, soldiers are being mistreated by their battalion commanders. I can't really show the pictures here, but they are being beaten up, beaten up by their own commanders. The claim is that uh, they are having to bribe their own commanders, um, that he takes part of their money and he offers them apparently to buy which orders they are to fulfill. Um, that would indicate that for money they can uh, make sure that they are not being sent into assaults, but rather other things. Things. Uh, not really good news um, being mistreated like this having your money being stolen by the commanders that should indicate lower morale and that should cause problems for the Russians but it the picture would be unclear if we wouldn't mention that on the other side of the front line it's not much better either or it's it's different they have different problems but they have problems as well CNN made a report here about Ukraine, and I quote from it, CNN, CNN spoke to six commanders and officers who are or were until recently fighting or supervising units in the area. Um, all six said desertion and insubordination are becoming a widespread problem, especially among the newly recruited soldiers. Um, we talked about it in the past. A big part of it can be attributed to the West. You cannot expect soldiers to have the same fighting morale when they think they are in a vastly outgunned position and they have uh, little chance of survival in comparison to them feeling self-confident because they had um, they have enough equipment and here after two and a half years of war the west could have been uh, able to supply ukraine with everything they needed when we look at the production capacity in the whole western world when it comes to defense equipment it could have been increased by this but we all know that it hasn't we all know that uh, there were domestic issues as well in the us for instance the um the um, biden not using what he was able to send and the congress the republican dominated congress blocking aids for months other countries have the same issues and on top you could probably argue that ukraine not doing the mobilization earlier and thus uh, not training the people enough and thus also giving them less hope will probably add to that problem as well but the western lack of uh, ramping up its defense production to a degree that could give uh, Ukraine material superiority, which should be possible, has not happened, and we see the effects on the ground as well. Ukrainians are trying to do their best though, and they have developed an air defense drone. Now it's been called, it was meant to shoot down here, to shoot down Russian drones. Um, from what I see, it's a kamikaze interceptor. So it's it's not like it's going to carry some kind of weapon system to shoot it down, but it's meant to hunt the to hunt Russian drones and ram itself into it. They also mentioned, for instance, for instance, it has air brakes because we've seen in some videos that uh, the interceptors bypass Russian uh, targets and thus have to reacquire them all of this while their battery is getting lower and lower. And here now they are working on something that can do it. I think it mentioned somewhere how high it can fly can fly for two and a half hours and I think for four kilometers altitude was it exactly here four kilometers altitude at uh, 160 to 170 kilometers uh, an hour so that should be enough for the Russian reconnaissance drones and this is really important not only do we have Russian mill bloggers already panicking about the high losses they're suffering um, in the past we mentioned that the Russians have improved massively their kill chain initially when the war began in the first months the Russian mill bloggers were saying we have to wait 24 hours hours until a target is being shelled when we have identified it the ukrainians have by long moved everything the ukrainians themselves shoot at us within half an hour so the difference in kill chain the speed of the kill chain was vastly different Russia has already fixed this. Russia is now even striking um, targets along the front line quickly with Iskander, which is not a frontline asset, but a core asset or even a strategic asset. And they have improved this, but to be able to strike that fast, they need reconnaissance. And there the small drones play their role. If Ukraine is able to take them down in masses, this will um, slow down the Russian response time and thus save Ukrainians and save Ukrainian equipment. Um, this is a a development where the Russians are getting worried, the Russian mill bloggers, that Ukraine becomes so good in this so far. The production capacity for those drones is being uh, named at 100 a month right now. Obviously, this would probably have to rise further, but it's good news nonetheless. Then we have Kiev Independent here saying that Ukraine is building underground weapons, weapon factories. Obviously, Ukraine is fully available in strike distance for the Russians with their ballistic and cruise missiles, and um, the defender needs to be 100% uh, successful the attacker only needs to be a successful once once that's why uh, above the surface 
weapons factories are always in danger. Ukraine does the logical thing. It's starting to move its stuff underground. We shouldn't forget that they have a lot of mines and they have mountains as well. So they probably take a lesson from history there to move their defense industry underground. In the political sphere, we have something interesting. Slatkov, I mentioned him a couple of times in the past. He's one of the bigger and um, more established Russian mill bloggers. He mentioned that the Russian Ministry of Defense started uh, started an investigation, uh, initiated an investigation against him, a criminal one, for the discrediting of the Russian armed forces. But his employer, a, a broadcasting service, as well as the presidential administration, protected him. Now, this is interesting, as it shows that there are judicial measures available against bloggers, but that aren't used. And this obviously allows for massive control for the mill bloggers. There, it's like the sword of Damocles swimming swinging above them and uh, by knowing that if they do self-censor they'll be safe if they do what the Russian government says they'll be safe but if they don't then they can end up in prison for several years like Igor Girkin, Igor Strel Strelkov has happened uh, like it has happened to him this is obviously going to be a helpful tool for the Russian government to control the mill bloggers then also the Ukrainians have now decided that the, the prisoners of war, the Russians ones, are no longer allowed to call home. So far this was allowed. Um, they will still allow letters that are in accordance with the Geneva Convention. Now, calls were never mentioned in the Geneva Convention. Ukraine did it by itself without international obligations to do that. They thought it's helpful in propaganda terms to have the soldiers call home and say, hey, I'm treated well, and this this might help Russian soldiers to capitulate more when they know they are being treated well. But recently, a lot of news have come out for the mistreatment of Ukrainian prisoners of war and for the execution, the summary execution of soldiers that capitulate. And this has led to an outcry in the public. There was an initiative to collect um, signatures to ban the calls. Initially it has been stopped, now the decision has been made that this privilege given to the Russian prisoners of war is being revoked. As said, fully in accordance to the Geneva Convention, they never had a right to it. Now it's this privilege that was granted to them is being taken away. Then we have news about international support. Um, Portugal is now delivering the 5KA-32s. It has promised quite, a, promised quite a while ago. This is a civilian transport helicopter from the Russian Kamov factory, and it has up to five tons in, in carrying capacity. Ukraine will receive five of them now. Sweden also offers, uh, has announced a 445 million US dollar in, in converted money. Eight package, a new one. It'll include a lot of ammunition mines. It'll include the assault boats, the Swedish ones. And, and that's the important thing, 72 million converted in US dollars investment in the Ukrainian defense industry. We talked about it in the past that Ukraine has claimed that they only can use one third of their domestic capacity simply because of the lack of funds and the West needs to invest in this but obviously this uh, carries with it the fear of Ukrainian corruption and it's not investment in the own defense industry. So a lot of na Western nations are hesitant with this. I think the Danish were the first ones to have started it. Now we see the Swedish joining this initiative. This will obviously help Ukraine quite a lot. And um, we have another video showing us how it looks after the after a um, flamethrower or dragon drone um, was was operating there. Um, it shows us the damage. Now the damage to the wood is limited, um, so the fire can't have burned that long, but you can see that the camouflage by the natural, uh, inhabit by the, the plants, etc. Here the trees are empty. They shouldn't be empty at this time of the year yet, so at least in this regard it will take away the Russians' cover by um, by burning everything on the ground, but you can see that the amount of fire that started wasn't enough to burn down the wooden constructions here. But that was it from me for now. If you like the situation report, please give it a thumbs up. It really helps with the algorithm. If you're new here, I would like to invite you to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon. And if you have something to add, if you have comments, please leave them in the comment section. This channel is only possible because of the support of viewers like you. If you like to support the channel, you can do so by the means in the description. But that's it from me for now. Thank you for watching and I'll be back.